August 26, 1946. A U.S. scientific expedition called Operation High Jump departs for the South Pole. It is led by esteemed naval officer and explorer, Admiral Richard Byrd. Admiral Richard Byrd was a very important admiral in the United States Navy. He graduated the United States Naval Academy at Annapolis. He fought in World War I. And after the war, he became an explorer. In 1926, Byrd made worldwide headlines when he and Navy Chief Aviation Pilot Floyd Bennett became the first people to ever fly over the North Pole. For their efforts, both men received the Congressional Medal of Honor. Later, when Byrd, at the age of 41, made the first solo flight over the South Pole, he became the youngest person ever promoted to the rank of Admiral in the history of the United States Navy. In 1946, Byrd oversaw Operation High Jump, the largest Antarctic expedition to date. The massive military convoy included 13 ships, 33 aircraft, and 4,700 troops. The U.S. Navy sent down a flotilla of ships under command of Admiral Byrd, and they came back after about nine months in Antarctica. Apparently, they actually fought a battle in Antarctica, probably between uh, remnants of the Third Reich and perhaps extraterrestrials as well. There were stories of craft coming up out of the water and attacking them. Flying saucers dealt a very heavy defeat to Bird's Operation High Jump. He gave a report in March of 1947 that said a new enemy had been discovered that could fly from pole to pole in an instant. Is it possible that this incredible story of a naval battle with extraterrestrials and encounters with craft capable of flying from the south to the north pole in an instant could actually be true? In 2018, more than 70 years after Bird's astounding claim, a satellite image captured what appeared to be a condensed water trail from an aircraft, or contrail, that could only have been produced by something traveling at incredibly high speeds. It extended the entire length of the Earth, longitudinally from the North Pole to the South Pole, which is 12,000 miles. The maximum length of time that a contrail can maintain its shape is 30 minutes, but most dissipate in less than 15. Only a craft capable of traveling faster than 50,000 miles per hour, or 10 times the speed of the fastest aircraft in existence today, could leave a contrail that would stretch the entire length of the Earth without breaking up. It's a seeming impossibility because it meant that some object was able to traverse the entire planet from pole to pole in a matter of minutes before the contrail disappeared. Whatever created that was going beyond Mach 10. Mach 10 is over 78,000 miles per hour. This was probably going much, much faster than that. So whatever it was, was something that more than likely we've never seen before. Dubna, Russia, December 26, 2018. An international team of physicists at the Flareoff Laboratory successfully fired the DC-280 cyclotron particle accelerator for the first time. Its beam is the most powerful ever recorded among the world's top nuclear facilities. The physicists will use the new facility to work on stabilizing super heavy metals, like element 115, so that their incredible energy potential can be harnessed. The Flerov Laboratory has been in the forefront of nuclear particle physics research and on January 29, 2019, TASS news agency came out 
with announcement that this year there'll be breakthroughs because they will use many more atoms than before when they discovered element 114 and 115. And definitely there is much more effort that's going on in Dubna today than we know about. It's center of excellence when it comes to research into super heavy elements. And whenever you're dealing with these super heavy elements, you are dealing with something that has the capability to generate large amounts of energy. And again, this is what Bob Lazar said was the ultimate secret of UFOs. So how long will it be before we are out there among the stars? And I think that's where we go next. We are at an interesting time in the development of our species. If the government has secretly been attempting to reverse engineer a stabilized version of element 115 recovered from an alien craft, will these new experiments accelerate that effort? I think we've got technology, bits and pieces, maybe an entire craft or more than one craft from somewhere else, stuff that we didn't make. The reality is, if this technology exists, and if we could figure out how it works, and if we can duplicate it, it has limitless potential that would propel humanity to a new level. This technology would alter the basic fabric of how we relate to the external world. If you can produce a gravity wave, you've won. That's it. The entire landscape of your reality changes. It is a fearsome technology, a powerful technology, and with great power comes great responsibility. The idea that extraterrestrials are giving us technology, perhaps, is an exciting idea, but we have to wonder just what interactions we really are having with extraterrestrials and what they think of us. And I like to think that the space programs of our own military and of other countries as well, that we are going to work together, that our own efforts to go into space and other planets are for peaceful purposes and not for ones of conquering other civilizations or taking other people's resources. And I think that the extraterrestrials too are watching us for those very reasons. The Aegean Sea, April 1900. Just 230 feet off the coast of the small island of Antikythera, sponge divers discover an ancient shipwreck 150 feet beneath the surface. Over the next two years, artifacts are recovered from the wreckage. And among them are the remains of a coral-encrusted metal box that dates back to the second century BC. It is the oldest mechanical computer ever found, predating artifacts of similar complexity by 1,500 years. So you have this small little box with dozens of cogwheels on the inside, and it has been determined that that analog computer was used to predict astronomical events, and so it was the first computer that has ever been created by mankind. The American scientists who were studying the Antikythera device actually said that discovering the Antikythera device was like finding a jet plane in the tomb of King Tut. It was so amazing to them. They had never, ever conceived that the ancient Greeks at 200 BC would have had the knowledge of mechanical devices like this. And it's completely changed the way we perceive ancient history. While excavation teams have still not determined for certain the origin of the ship on which the Antikythera mechanism was found, the leading candidate is the island of Rhodes. According to some contemporary accounts, Rhodes was once home to what by today's standards would be considered high technology. In the 5th century BC, the poet Pindar wrote that Rhodes was once adorned with statues that came to life, like living and moving creatures. He wrote that they all of a sudden became alive. 
And so the question then arises, well, if you have a lifeless object first, and then all of a sudden somebody breathes life into something, could it be that we have references to some type of machines? Where did the people of Rhodes get the knowledge of how to create these moving statues 2,500 years ago? I believe that it is just what Pinder said, which is they got it from the gods. Well, who are these gods? The gods are real people. They're extraterrestrials who had this technology, shared it with humanity. And now, when we see the Antikythera mechanism, there's something you can put your hands on that shows that they had the capability to do advanced machine work. It's 1,500 years too early, at least. The point is, that technology really exists, and from a technology like that, going to robotics is not too much further, and extraterrestrials would very well have had that capability for the time, if you believe what this legend says on face value. November 17th, 2015. A team of researchers from North Carolina State University and Rice University unveil the first motor-driven submersible nanomachines ever created. Molecular nanotechnology is the idea of building devices, machines, at a molecular scale. Nano refers to a billion of a meter, so very, very small. We're getting down to atomic scale. Measuring only 244 atoms across, these miniature robots are designed to deliver specialized medicines throughout the body using the bloodstream. Scientists have created biobots that are the first of its kind. These tiny little biohybrid simian bots are capable of driving to viscous material through our bodies. They take submersible nanomachines that can be controlled with UV light, and using the UV light, they can control where these nanomachines take nutrients and take medicines into the body. As long as we have a way of controlling them from the outside, they can move around very, very quickly, perform a function. If we're looking at operating on a cancer, then potentially they could do that operation for you from within. This could lead to huge advances in medicine, in healing, leading to nanomachines that could actually heal the wounds in our bodies, close things up much faster, repair damaged tissue, extend our lifespan, and literally bring us into a new level of human evolution. And some propose this technology is advancing so rapidly that it will not just be future generations that will live tens or even hundreds of years longer, but people who are alive today. The possibility of reversing human aging as opposed to just slowing it down is not a very big stretch. So if you understand aging and the fundamentals of the processes that are leading to it, it would be quite possible both to slow it and it would also be possible to reverse it. An example of this is a study that has gone on at Harvard by reversing the muscle tissue in mice. We have actually reversed the age in these mice. And so if we can do that in the laboratory setting, it's only a matter of time before we're able to reverse our own aging process. Could millions of microscopic robots soon be swimming in our bloodstreams? augmenting our immune system, and even reversing the aging process entirely, as transhumanists believe. Ancient astronaut theorists suggest that if such a transformation does occur, it may be a sign that we are evolving to become more like our alien ancestors. 
When we look into the past, there's a clear record of people who have lived a much longer lifespan than what we have today. We have to wonder if these beings weren't given or had access to some type of nanotechnology. And it fuels the idea and understanding and our drive today to be like the gods. And this important nanotechnology is something that extraterrestrials and other advanced civilizations would already have. And it would only make sense that if extraterrestrials are coming to our planet, they would have brought this nanotechnology with them.